Thank you so much, Erwin. It is amazing to be here. Um, as Erwin mentioned, our panel is on the impact of copyright law on free expression and the preservability of human rights media. Um, my name is Yvonne Ng. I'm the Archives Program Manager at Witness. Um, we're an organization that supports people to use video to protect and defend human rights. I am so extremely pleased to be moderating this panel with our speakers representing civil society organizations um, based around the world that are focused on human rights, freedom of expression and information, and who are working at this intersection of social justice, technology, um, media. Um, this panel actually originated at the RightsCon Summit um, last year, but you know, when we were doing it, it I it, I really thought that you know the discussion of the our discussion of the ways that U.S. copyright law and specifically the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA, um, and its impact on the availability and the preservability of journalism and human rights um, media would be really um, relevant to bring to this international audience of audiovisual archivists and preservationists and open source um, developers. And, and, and that, you know, this discussion really spoke to this year's theme in particular of, you know, why op open just isn't enough. Um, so I, I, I'd like to turn to my panelists now just to have them briefly introduce themselves and, and, and their organizations and what they do, if we could just do a go around. And I will go first to um, uh, Gabby. Thanks, Yvonne, and hi, everyone. Uh, this is my first No Time to Wait, um, so I've been really um, enjoying the sessions. Um, so my name is Gabriella Ivans. I'm the head of open source research at Human Rights Watch um, in the Digital Investigations Lab team. And the open source in this part means uh, open source information rather than open source software. Um, but I use a lot of that in the research. Um, so I, I work trying to find uh, public um, publicly available data to support our investigations into human rights violations. Um, and so a lot of that involves video um, and archiving websites um, and other kind of content. Um, so yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, Viviana? Hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I'm Viviana Rangel. I'm from Fundación Carisma, a civil society organization from Colombia. We work on digital rights uh, and human rights in the digital uh, age. I'm, the, I'm a project coordinator in democratization of knowledge and culture uh, area. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana. And Vladimir. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vladimir Cortez. I am the Digital Rights Program uh, Officer at Article 19 in the Office of uh, Mexico and Central America. I'm really happy uh, to be uh, for the first time at uh, uh, an Octam uh, Forward uh, conference. And uh, we I mainly work on the promotion and defense of freedom of expression, access to information, and protecting uh, digital rights, uh, which uh, relates, yeah, to the idea of uh, preservation of uh, how uh, copyright impacts and to the exercise of uh, journalistic and investigative uh, pieces, and uh, yeah, the idea of that uh, there should be like uh, remaining important information and relevant information in the digital realm. So yeah, very happy to be to be here and share yeah some some inputs and some insights from from our side. Thank you. So as you can see, I am very rightfully very excited to have um, these panelists here today. Um, so I think just to get us started, I think I'm going to turn to Vladimir um, to just to give us a short overview of what the DMCA even is. Um, you know, and, and if you could talk in particular to also to section um, five, uh, 512, which deals with online content. And, you know, if you, could, you talk about why this might be relevant to folks outside of the United States. Um, uh, no. Yes, thank you. Um, so very briefly, uh, when we are like talking about the impact of, uh, of copyright, uh, we for sure like uh, taking into consideration the different legislations that uh, we may have uh, at the local level or national level. There is one in particular which uh, we are going to, to mention here and, and, and drives also the attention because of the extent that this uh, type of legislation creates and, uh, and inhibits and sometimes like restricts uh, certain rights. That's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, better known 
as DMCA. Uh, a US law that was like passed in uh, 1998, uh, imagining this uh, time in which the internet was growing fast. And uh, there were like expectations to do uh, so. And there was like this uh, first intent to uh, balance the interest of copyright owners, internet users, and online uh, service uh, providers. Uh, the DMCA is a collection of different provisions that are like loosely related, but we, as uh, Ivan mentioned, we're going to focus or uh, part of the session is going to be focused on section 512, which provides for content takedowns. The purpose of this uh, section was like to help, uh, ideally, to online service providers, web hosts, social media sites, and others, and users, content authors, and readers or viewers address copyright infringements. And the DMCA includes something that uh, is also like relevant in uh, the discussion of, of, of the impact and the extent that it has to uh, certain contents in the digital realm, which includes uh, something called safe harbor provisions that protects online services providers from being held uh, liable for copyright infringement committed by the users. So what does this mean? It uh, basically means that uh, uh, service providers can take advantages of the safe harbor if they comply with the notice and take down steps laid out in section uh, 512. If a service provider doesn't comply, does not comply with, with this, it can lose the access to this uh, safe harbor provision and became, uh, become liable for uh, expensive copyright damages in US courts. So Section 512 allows copyright owners to send a simple notice to the service provider uh, when their content has been like, uh, posted without their permission and have the post takedown right now, uh, something known as notice and takedown, and which we are, I'm going to also briefly uh, explain a little bit further, uh, how uh, other legislations around the world is uh, also like uh, introducing uh, this. But uh, as we are going to see, uh, this provision and this uh, 512 uh, uh, DMCA uh, uh, provision at, at, at the MCA, it's uh, also already like uh, being uh, abusive and uh, in sometimes like uh, used fraudulently and abusively to remove content that is uh, of public uh, interest and attempting. Oops, sorry for that. That was my timing. <laughs> uh to uh use in, in an abusive way so just like yeah this is a very uh, general framework but then we're going to see in the details how this is like really impacting uh human rights and uh different uh pieces that it's uh, being produced in the uh, digital ecosystem thank you Thank you, Vladimir. And yeah, we're, we are going to dig into some examples and what we're seeing uh, in different parts of the world. Um, before we do that, I, another part of the DMCA that I think is really relevant for us to talk about is Section 1201, um, which relates to circumvention tools. And so, Gabby, I was wondering if you could give us a short introduction to, to that section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as Vladimir stuck to his three minutes, I'm going to stick to my <laughs> two as closely as I can. So this is going to be very brief. Um, so section 1201 um, generally prohibits two types of activities. Um, the first is circumventing uh, a, technologi a technological measure. Um, so this could be um, uh, un uh, going to unauthorized access or unauthorized um, reproduction of a copyright work. Um, so circumventing a technological measure could involve decrypting an uh, encrypted work, um, other kinds of technology that could involve bypassing, removing, avoiding, um, deactivating um, a measure that's put in place uh, without the authority of the copyright of the copyright owner. And the second type of activity it prohibits is uh, trafficking in certain circumvention technologies. So this could be manufacturing, importing, or even offering to the public. Um, so when the DMCA came into effect in '98. I think the, the technology it was largely focused on was traditional media. So maybe in the future DVDs, um, and now um, the section 1201 um, also covers dig digital locks uh, on software, um, since this is also a copyrighted work. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about later um, because it can have an impact on a large amount of people. Uh, I've been reading stories about farmers um, who want to reconfigure their tractors um, to recognize new parts uh, without paying or waiting for a technician. 
um, to type in a password um, and, and uh, buying uh, software in order to circumvent this and um, being caught up in this um, or hobbyists trying to reverse engineer calculators uh, so they could work on their operating systems. Um, and so we'll talk a bit about this later in an example that uh, Yvonne and I uh, were part of last year. Yeah, thank you, Gabby. Yeah, and as Gabby mentioned, it's a whole bunch of these sort of legitimate activities, um, uh, you know, not accounting for things like fair use um, and, and non-infringing uses. So, so um, I want to uh, talk now uh, about um, so the, this online content and the consequences of uh, the notice and takedown provisions that um, Vladimir was discussing and how they're being used, uh, as he mentioned, to, and, and abused to, to suppress information. So I want to turn now to uh, Viviana. Um, if you could share with us sort of what you're seeing in Colombia, um, how are these notice and takedown provisions, um, you know, how are they playing out uh, where you are? Thank you. I, don't, I want to share with you an unpublished research that we just finished like one week ago. Uh, so we are going to share it uh, next year. This research uh, we call automatic copyright detection, a tool of inequality. So our research was conducted in 2020 in Colombia. And it shows how automatic copyright infringement detection tools produce illegitimate illegitimate notifications that harm the ability of small digital content producers to attract new audiences and gain economic benefits or digital interactions with their work. The research found multiple instances and unjustified notifications of alleged copyright infringement uh, targeting public domain content, original content produced by the recipient of the notification or content where copyright law overreaches. Producers facing unfair notifications claim that the appeals and counter notification processes do not help them defend their rights. Uh, the platform's appeals interface does not help resolve cases, leaving creators at the mercy of their own content. These systems generate damage to the ability of these creators to create, uh, maintain, and monetize an audience on these platforms and it affects the freedom of expressions of small producers in that it creates a deterrent incentive for them. Uh, on the contrary, it incentivizes large producers to continue to enforce copyright content over which they have no legal rights. So we analyze uh, more or less seven cases uh, that are journalists, artists in general, but con uh, are content creators. Uh, due to the frequency with which these cases are reported, the consequence they have for the work of digital creators and the risk to their human rights and freedom of expression, we decide to conduct this investigation because we also uh, find found that in in the time of the um, uh, pandemic, the strictly uh, measures with the pandemic, uh, these cases were increasingly uh, were increasingly in the um, in, in Colombia. Uh, uh, this investigation into the role played by copyright tools in erroneous notifications against creators in Colombia and the affectations that these erroneous notifications general, ge generate for creators uh, was by a researcher called Jose Luis. Uh, he is working with Charisma to try to, to find the use to make a bigger uh, strategy uh, ask some, some uh, answers uh, from the platform. For this purpose, we conducted semi-structured interviews with seven content creators and interviews with representative of three platforms, TikTok, Twitter, and Google. Uh, Facebook did not respond to our interview request. 
uh, the creator interviews were analyzed to understand the types of harm that are generated, not only when these notifications are received and the change in productions routines that are caused by the risk of receiving them. So in our research, we found creators had uh, made notices for three types of content. The first one is content that belonged to the public domain. The second one, uh, self-created content. And third one, where a street application of copyright law generates unfair situation. So uh, as a conclusion, we found that this is an unequal system. As we saw, these tools are a burden for small creators. They arbitrarily generate notifications that are difficult to respond uh, to and cause harm to their work and the future viability of their activity as create. We think these tools are unfairly benefit large content producers who have access to tools, social content. And it's tools with explicitly creator with the Viacom and Time Warner's of the world in mind, as a Google executive admit in 27. And Google spokespeople explicitly admit that rights owners want the most automatic mechanism possible to manage their rights. Indeed, a 2018 document we sit in, we cited in our document says these tools are used not only as an anti-piracy solution, but also as a resource generating tool for major producer companies. Um, Indeed, Content ID is a crucial piece of YouTube's viability as a global video platform. It enables it to detect copyright infringement on a scale sufficient to meet its legal requirements. As some academics have argued, YouTube is unlikely to revert to a case-by-case -case detection system for copyright infringement because it would cost too much money. Uh, presumably, the same is true of other platforms that use these tools. In, in the interview given by Google, a spokesperson for investigation, one of them stated that YouTube has a mechanism to include those who don't use the system in the right way. And I acknowledge that abuse of these tools can cause a significant damage to the ecosystem. However, he did not provide details on how the mechanism works or how it checks how many unwarranted notification ID issues. Uh, for this reason, Copyright infringement tools allow large producers to act as gatekeepers on the platforms as they give them the real and efficient power to control, regulate, and influence the digital circulation of content. In other words, they give them an unfair power over the distribution of content from other producers that they have no way to contract. This, according to some academics, results in, results in transformative work, works such as remix, parody, or satire, among others, be, being in an unbalanced position from the beginning. This, this imbalance that not only occurred with that type of content, as has been repeatedly expressed in the academic literature of, of this topic, content ID and uh, presumably other tools like this uh, drives copyright owners to take advantage of the hard work on, and creativity on, of YouTubers by taking away all the monetary in, incentives. Um, the price of, uh, finally, the price of using tools for automatic detection, detection of copyright infringement as viable and useful tools for, for large content corporations and platforms are all the negative consequences described throughout, throughout this report. A small and independent creators many times end up being victims of unfair decisions made by other actors to a power that is a product of the balance of economic and political forces that influence the, the functioning of the platforms and that for that reason does not have an efficient counterweight. So, 
that's our research. <laughs> we will share the document yeah. next year. Thank you, Viviana. I think we're all really looking forward to seeing the, the, the full report. Um, turning quickly to um, Vladimir, um, I was wondering if you could just talk very briefly about sort of what some cases you're seeing in, in Mexico and other parts of Latin America. Sure, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so what we are seeing is uh, how in the context, uh, even like hard for uh, journalists to be exercised, in uh, Mexico and other countries in, in Latin America that it's uh, on their attack. Uh, we just like in 2020 document around 692 attacks against the press. Uh, so an attack every 13 hours. In this scenario, the MC MCA claims adds a series of pressures against uh, the press. We have uh, doc documented different cases in which the MCA has like silence or used to silence Mexican press. We have the case of uh, uh, new, uh, journal, uh, uh, news media called uh, Notigodines. We have another one, uh, other journalist, Mexican journalist, uh, Pedro Canche, who also uh, faced this uh, abusive and fraudulent claims to take down uh, these, their information. And the most impressive, it's uh, one that we document from a new site called Pagina 66, which it's like not use, not just like using an, an abusive way, uh, DMCA to take down information of uh, presumably acts of corruption or information that relates to uh, how it's misused uh, public resources in, in, in Mexico and it's being exposed by these uh, investigations, but how uh, actually, certain actors are also uh, creating falsely, uh, uh, like uh, like the page, and and they are like modifying the, the time and to to see to try to reflect that this was like created before the original uh, piece, and it's like uh, so contradictory that uh, this, the the same person who is like uh, creating. Uh, uh, apparently, it's the one who is like also uh, filling this type of uh, of the MCF. So at the end, what we're seeing, there are like not enough safeguards to really analyze and to really uh, take into consideration this uh, type of uh, abusive waste. And even some social media companies or so, so, so some companies as, as Google have re recognized how uh, this uh, process of uh, automa automation that they may have and how, one, how can the impact of one falsely uh, claim can uh, actually like uh, uh, affect not just journalistic pieces, but also some other public domain uh, information that uh, should remain in, uh, in the web. So we are like really aware and we're like uh, really worried of uh, how this is uh, increasingly and we are also expecting to uh, get further next year with uh, other information about uh, how it's it's it also relates to someone who is like paying to uh, re uh, remove uh, uh, public information and political information that it's uh, important and relevant for a democratic uh, society and for the a broader debate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think these both of uh, our speakers show how this impact this US law is having a global impact and consequences, you know, outside of that of its own jurisdiction. I, I want to turn now to um, Gabby to talk about um, this section uh, 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 1201, the anti circumvention um, uh, uh, issue and um, so, so some of you might know that last year, um, the video downloading tool YouTube DL was temp temporarily removed from GitHub due to this, a DMCA takedown notice um, request. So I, I wanted to ask Gabby to tell us a little bit more about um, YouTube, YouTube DL, its relevance to your work in open source digital investigations and human rights, um, and, and just what happened last year and how groups like Human Rights Watch and, and GitHub and other groups um, responded. Sure. So, um... We use, well, I use YouTube DL, um, this video downloading tool that works on over a thousand sites every day in my work. And I think Yvonne uses it every day in her work um, with Witness um, and lots of other groups use it to archive uh, human rights documentation. Um, and so when uh, the Recording Industry Association of America on October 20th issued a DMCA takedown request under 1201, um, requesting that GitHub take down all of the YouTube DL repos. Um, yeah, I think we were all panicked. I remember messaging Yvonne and just, yeah, in complete panic that 
this tool that we all use and train people on uh, might be taken down. Um, so the argument was that it infringed, infringed copyright of um, the RIAA's members. Um, and potentially it could be used to download a Taylor Swift video, but also it has lots of other uses like accessibility um, for people with low uh, connectivity. Um, videos are, yeah, could be under, licensed under Creative Commons, fair use, um, and also human rights purposes like the one we were using it for. Um, so GitHub took it down. Um, and then EFF was involved with YouTube DL, um, and they made an argument that uh, kind of twofold. So number one, they made the argument that they weren't circumventing um, any technical, uh, technological protection measures. Um, and the second argument were, was that they weren't infringing on uh, any copyright, uh, and they were providing this information to the public. Um, so they came from those two arguments. Um, so GitHub, um, with EFF's um, response and you know, groups like Witness, Human Rights Watch, Mnemonic also put out public statements to say, to state the use case, our use case of this tool. Um, GitHub reinstated YouTube DL. Um, and um, in, their, in their note, uh, they said it was very rare, 2% of their takedowns are under 1201, um, but this is increasing now. Um, so, they um, set up a developers fund that offered a million, I think there's a million dollars um, to help developers to fight back against these claims, but they argued that this would have set a really dangerous precedent. Um, so uh, yeah, so this was the case that we worked on last year that, that kind of started, um, for me at least, to think more about copyright and the impact it might have uh, also on human rights documentation. Yeah, so fortunately, this was a story with a happy ending, but it was quite scary to see how like, just a spurious claim by this industry you know, association could remove a tool that so many people relied on for like legitimate um, purposes. There's so much more that we could talk about. There's like very, we only had half an hour, so uh, we can't get to everything we wanted to talk about. But um, just in the, in the couple of minutes we have left, uh, Erwin, are there any, were there any questions that we should address or... Um, Yes, um, Rob had a, had a question. I think maybe this is one for Gabby or for you, Yvonne, whether um, uh, the right to be forgotten also had any impact on the, uh, the work of human rights organizations. Do any of our panelists um, want to address this issue? Uh, I will just like add a, a few lines. Uh, in, in Latin America, we are like, uh, and from Article 19, we are like uh, opposing to this idea of uh, uh, right to be forgotten. Oh, sorry, uh, there is uh, going to be an ongoing, so I'm going to pass. Um, Vivi, Hannah, or, or Gabby? I, I don't have anything substantial to add that wouldn't, Vlad's, um, that was so interesting to hear why they were pushing against <laughs> it. I hope the announcement ends soon. Um, but yeah, G GDPR and um, also associated within this, I think, does impact uh, some of the way we think about archiving. I'll just say this. Sorry, I already already passed. Uh, <laughs> so just to say that more, rather than uh, right to be forgotten, it's like right to memory and right to not forget uh, our history and uh, the things that are happening in, in Latin America, how the political abusive the dictatorships and many things that we are seeing on how uh, Petitions and certain actors are actually like using uh, some data protection and some DMCA copyright to really take down this information that it's uh, relevant for, uh, for us. Thank you. Right in time between the two announcements. Um, there's some, some fascinating back talk also on the chat about, uh, because this is probably the first time farming was ever mentioned during a, a no time to talk, uh, no time to wait uh, talk. Um, and so some interesting tidbits right there that will be in the, in the collaborative notes. Uh, thank you uh, all the panelists of this session. Um, I think this is really relevant and I'm, and I'm sharing another related report in the chat as we speak. But now it's time to move on to the world, the wonderful world of standards and standardization and standard adoption. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all uh, very much. Clapping for all the 90, 100, 101 uh, participants in the, in the session.